Okay, thanks very much. Thanks to Adele for inviting me. Good afternoon, everybody. I've got 10 minutes to show you some uh, cool ways how uh, space is helping uh, uh, oceanographic activities. Um, there's a whole bunch of programmatic stuff. I'm from the European Space Agency. I'm not an astronaut. I work on uh, uh, the exploitation of Earth observation satellite data. We do all sorts of things, the whole range of space stuff. So we, and we spend about four billion a year, that's what that's saying, on uh, space stuff throughout Europe. We're not part of the EU, we're a separate intergovernment organization, working as a way of um, member states collaborating what they do rather than um, at the sort of higher level dictating stuff. So um, satellite earth observation in terms of um, uh, science and policy. Um, the European Space Agency, some of you might have seen this slide before, we've, we've been developing satellites since the very first Meteosat satellite back in the 70s, I think it was. Uh, we're now on the uh, building the, well, we've got the second generation of geostationary satellites, M Meteosat up, up and working, developing the third generation. We've got the first generation of polar Earth observation uh, meteorological satellites up and running and we're working uh, on developing the second generation. So that's the inside track on there. Also on Earth observation, we've been running Earth observation missions, developing and launching them. First one was launched in 1991, that was ERS-1, followed by its cousin ERS-2 in 1995 and Envisat in 2002 and that is leading into the Copernicus Sentinel missions that uh, Gilles Ollier um, mentioned uh, earlier, that's the Sentinel 1-5, uh, providing long-term operational continuity of uh, all these missions. And the third line, the outside line there, is uh, dedicated satellites looking at particular Earth science problems, so GOCHE or GOST, depending on where you are, looking at um, uh, precise geoid measurements, SMOS measuring soil moisture and ocean salinity, and cryosat measuring um, sea ice thickness, plus a whole bunch of others on um, uh, magnetic stuff and uh, atmospheric things that are, um, well, the, the magnetic one swarm will be launched some point in the next few weeks. Okay, a whole bunch of science results resulting since um, uh, this on the ERS Envisat, the middle track, if you like, um, going from um, uh, basic uh, 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 analyses, things like uh, air pollution, through to um, the development and you know, availability of uh, climate quality data sets from uh, satellite earth observation. So we've had a dedicated initiative putting not just ESA data together, but um, everybody else's data together, looking at trying to put long-term climate quality time series together for a whole bunch of essential climate variables as defined by the, uh, um, the GCOS uh, guys. So there's uh, parameters in there like uh, sea level anomaly, sea surface change, uh, ocean color, as well as a whole bunch of atmospheric and uh, uh, cryospheric uh, parameters as well. And we'll be, we'll be looking at as more satellites become available on a longer time series or we become better at using the data like in ocean salinity, these will also be um, brought into the climate uh, quality uh, group as well. And you see the impact of that is interesting. If you look maybe at the IPCC reports from uh, five years ago, ten years ago, there was very little satellite data actually used in the um, analysing the climate change impact. The one that's just coming out now, if you've not seen any advanced versions, there's an awful lot of satellite data in there because we've got the time series and we've got ways of combining it and it's now climate quality uh, and quality controlled. So we know what we're doing and it's climate stuff. Okay, we develop satellites, we launch them, we operate them and we develop services. That's a whole bunch of services we've done there. Um, okay, just click through there, that's the scientific ones. Um, Sentinels, let's say that's the... Um, uh, operational ones. These represent, as Jill was saying yesterday, step change in the volume of data that's going to be available. Okay, I mean it's not just a few images here and there anymore. These things are washing machines. They, they're running routinely all the time, huge volumes of data coming out, creating uh, big data problems for Earth observation we've never really had to face before. And just to make things simple, um, I've coloured in the uh, uh, marine parameters in red, so you can see there's a whole bunch of marine parameters directly available from uh, these different satellites um, guaranteed until after 2020 thanks to um, uh, long-term EU funding coming in and the initial funding through ESA and the member states. So we have Sentinel-1, two of them, Sentinel-2, two of them, and Sentinel-3, two of them, measuring all these parameters routinely all over the world. Okay, uh, just some of the results so far. So in terms of marine science, where's space contributing? Well, some examples already done in Ireland, for example. There's been an activity on a um, programme uh, using um, uh, SMOS data, looking at, or a whole range of data, looking at improving the sea spray source function. That's an important parameter for um, uh, air-sea uh, interactions under an uh, initiative called um, uh, uh, SOLAS. Uh, SMOSPROC. 
uh, another Irish programme looking at how do we relate, we measure the sea surf facility, how do we, how do we relate that down to the uh, ocean processes that are happening below the, the surface and how can we then characterise uh, processes such as heat, heat flux, so that's uh, quite advanced. And there's a workshop on these things uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think in Galway. Um, looking at the more uh, operational things, because what we try and do is try and support science, we try and support commercial activities, we try and support the move from science to commercial activities, so this is one. Um, when we started the, deriv the derivation of these parameters, things like wind, wave currents was a uh, research topic, now it's pretty routine and it's actually being used systematically in the marine renewable sector, so we can look at wind wave current statistics over 20 years for where do you cite stuff, what's the resource assessment and also the nowcast, um, what's actually happening, how much energy are you going to be looking at, bathymetry, benthic habitat data as well for where you're going to cite stuff if you're looking at marine uh, spatial planning, temperature, water quality parameters again for uh, environmental impact assessment. So there's a whole bunch of data in there. Um, you can also track swell waves as well. There's a nice animation with yeah, global swell waves, again, linked to uh, either marine safety or uh, uh, offshore renewables. Um, another area we're looking at is things like um, enabling the maritime economy. So this was um, a seismic survey done of the Porcupine Basin, west, west of Ireland. The seismic guys said, look, we're not, we're not going to do this survey if we're going to pull the, um, the, the, the streamers in, go back to port, refuel, come back out to the basin, deploy the streamers, uh, it's going to, I mean, it's days of downtime every time. So uh, we, want to, we want to refuel at sea. At, fuel, uh, at sea, refueling's not such a good idea because if there's a, a leak, it's bad. Um, so the Coast Guard said, all right, um, we'll authorise this, but we're, um, rather than you guys coming in or rather than us helicoptering somebody out and uh, monitoring this, we'll monitor you from space. So we monitor them from space, saving a huge amount of money. And I understand that the uh, test drilling coming out of this uh, seismic uh, survey was quite successful. So you know saying the um, seismic survey, the economic viability of the seismic survey was enabled by the cost effectiveness of the uh, satellite data. Ensuring environmentally friendly shipping is another area we're looking at. So for example, um, the top diagram there is not really a marine observation, it's an atmospheric observation. So we're able to measure NO2 concentrations and these can be used as proxies for other emissions that vessels are making. The shipping industry makes a lot of claims as to how clean uh, vessels are. In fact, there's a lot of uh, SOx uh, emissions because the fuel you use is uh, uh, not the best. So we're starting to be able to get uh, better tracers on that and actually look at uh, what are the, uh, um, the, the actual atmospheric emissions from ships. And in terms of um, the, the um, uh, sequence on the right shows you the evolution. We've been working on satellite oil spill detection since the launch of our first satellite. It's now, as a result of all the effort, it's now operational. It's called the Clean Sea Net Service. It's run by the European Maritime Safety Agency, fully operational, completely based on uh, satellite-based surveillance. And the third thing down there, um, there's a new regulation under discussion coming through on uh, basically end-to-end -end, um, management of uh, ships. So you're no longer allowed to, um, at the end of the life of the ship, take it off to India or Pakistan, run it onto a beach and dismantle it, and all the asbestos and whatever just gets dumped. Uh, you're not allowed to do that anymore. We can monitor that through a combination of the AIS that uh, was being talked about before and monitoring where these ships are going using imagery. Okay, a lot of uh, uh, resource assessment as well. Uh, this, again, you know, based on um, uh, R&D on fusing different data source, sources, we can now if, uh, effectively monitor uh, IUU fisheries, detect IUU fisheries when it's happening, either the fishing activity or things like uh, down there, uh, anomalous proximity of one vessel to another that's indicative of uh, at sea transfer of catches, so we can detect that sort of thing. Um, we don't do anything, we don't intervene ourselves, but we tell the authorities that are responsible and they'll often uh, send something. Um, okay, last one, uh, looking at coastal water quality and uh, benthic habitats, a uh, whole range of uh, uh, parameters there derived from uh, Earth observation. That's great for Europe, okay, a lot of these things are used for EU policies. Now, um, I think what you have to think about though, and what we're uh, increasingly working with, with uh, organisations like the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, is we've got global observing capability, we've got a leading edge capability in Europe to develop information services based on that data. Let's try and export these services outside. And we do that through the development banks, and that just shows you some of the, uh, uh, the match between uh, income and, uh, in countries and income in exclusive economic zones uh, for the various resources. You see there is a global opportunity for providing marine information for better management of resources. Uh, a couple of examples there, uh, benthic habitat mapping and uh, pollution detection. Okay, we run uh, various programs. Let's say these are opportunities for tenders. You can bid for them. Um, if you want more information, Barry Fennell is the, our delegate and he's sat at the back there. Ask him uh, or contact me by email. Um, just to conclude, okay, 
we've been doing this for a while. Uh, we support science research going into operations, and we think we can go for we, we're looking to go forward internationally, but also in an Atlantic framework um, for Europe. That's going to need effective joining up of national activity, national funding, ESA funding, and EU funding, the sort of things Jill was talking about yesterday. But we've been doing that for a while. We know how to do it, and we're pretty confident we can take this forward in the future. Thanks very much.